we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wherever the darkness creeps into our hearts, our minds, our lives, our very soul, wherever the darkness gets ever closer, may your word be for us this day, your truth, be the light that shatters the darkness that we might leave here not in fear, not in anxiety, but in joy and a rekindled love for you. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Oh, many, many years ago, probably around the 70s, there was a campaign among churches that said, keep Christ in Christmas. That has kind of given way to talking about Jesus being the reason for the season. That became the new mantra. But let's go back to keep Christ in Christmas. And, I, and there were bumper stickers to the effect and everything. I, I'd like to start a campaign where we had bumper stickers that said, keep Herod in Christmas. I'm sure there'd be some people saying, what do you mean by that? Is your first reaction to that, that Herod's a bit too nasty, too hostile, too mean? But there is a, d a dark side to Christmas, is there not? Most of our Christmas stories don't have that. The closest we get would be the Grinch that stole Christmas. But then we know how that turns out. I like to remind my wife that Die Hard with Bruce Willis is a Christmas movie after all, and that has a dark side to it. But she's still not buying that one. But there is a dark side to Christmas. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a postcard picture of, of Christmas. Luke is, is, is a shutterfly image of, of Christmas. And now we have Matthew before us that Pete's going to read in just a moment. Gone are the women, Mary and Elizabeth, gone are the women, and enter the men, the magi. Gone is the stable, now they're in the king's palace. Crazy King Herod. Gone are the shepherds, now enter the magi. Gone is Mary pondering and holding the cuddly baby. Now watch Mary and Joseph fleeing for their lives with their infant son. These, th these are the, some of the differences between these two gospel accounts. Where exactly does such a dark episode like what Matthew portrays, where does it fit into the bright, joyous music that still rings in our ears from Christmas? But dear ones, we must hear the whole story of both Luke and Matthew, because if we don't hear the whole story, we may focus on the wrong story. And so I believe that Matthew and Luke together prov pr provide that for us. So let's, let's ponder the thought of keeping Herod in Christmas under three truths. First, Herod reminds us, as I told the kids, Herod reminds us of the world that Jesus entered. Jesus entered into a world where he and his family were homeless. They were refugees. That relates to us, does it not? Violence and hatred were, and, and terrorism, let's just call it what it is, they were on the threshold of this young family from the outset. It's in that context I want you to listen to the gospel lesson now. All 23 verses. And I'm just going to ask you to listen this time. I know here you like to read it together, but sometimes there is power in just listening and not reading. It takes more attention, but just take it to heart if you will. Pete? Sure. 
Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for whom you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under. Then Herod, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. The, in the original language, and Pete, we're coming back to you. Has this ever happened to you in the middle of a reading where you just got interrupted? We're good. When it says that Herod became furious, the original language is Herod shook violently because he was so troubled. Why does one of the most feared rulers in the world shake violently because of a baby? We'll talk about that more in a minute. And Herod became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be filled, that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the Gospel of the Lord. (laughs) 
Nobody can argue with the fact that Matthew, as a person, as a writer, is a realist. The gospel is not a fairy tale. The gospel is not some serene, sentimental picture. Christmas is not some feel-good dream. Christmas is the story of how goodness and love come into the, to the darkness of this world, the nightmare of this world, and it carries light with it. The Advent wreath that we talked about, it carries the light of hope, it carries the light of peace, it carries the light of love and of joy. Jesus came into our world, not just his world, he came into our world, the world of violence, the world of poverty, the world of hatred, the world of sin, the world of violence. He came into a world filled with fears and tears. He came into a world filled with disease and distrust. He comes into our lives, into our heartbreaks, and into our sadnesses, and into our grief, carrying the light. But alas, as it was true in Jesus' day, it's true in our day. John 1, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He came to his own, but his own would not receive him. This is the world Jesus entered, your world, my world. I woke up New Year's Day morning only to hear of more killings and more shootings. And I say, we couldn't even get through the morning of the first day without this. But this is the world that Jesus enters. The Gospel of Matthew allows us to see the insanity of Herod woven into the serenity of Christmas. Mary rejoicing, Rachel weeping, Christmas joy, Christmas tears. All of this, all of what I've just described is wrapped up in one gift, a baby, a baby born in Bethlehem, who is a son, given to us by our eternal father. Matthew's gospel reveals the first truth. Matthew's gospel reveals the darkness of the world that Jesus entered so that we could face the darkness of our world knowing that Jesus understands. But the second truth is this. Jesus not only entered the darkness of the world, he entered the darkness of the human heart. We need to keep Herod in Christmas because he reminds us, he reminds you, he reminds me of how depraved our human heart is. We live in a world that continually is making Herod's choice. Senseless killings, violence in the street, children being slaughtered through a variety of ways, not the least of which, of course, is abortion. We, as a people, need to repent of the evil, not only in this world, but of the evil in our heart. The evil that's represented by dear Darth is evil that sits in here and in you. If you doubt that, then consider for a moment the true story of a man by the name of Yahil Denor. Yahil Denor was a Holocaust survivor. And when the war was over and they held the Nuremberg trials to try those who had committed the atrocity of the murder of millions, Yahil Denor was one of the witnesses, even though many of the, the, the people being tried were in absentia because they had not been captured yet, Yahil gave witness particularly to one soldier, one German soldier named Adolf Eichmann. Those trials completed years later when Eichmann was finally captured, he was tried again in Israel in 1961. This time, Yahil Denor was able to attend the trial in person. And when he walked in to the courtroom and he saw Adolf Eichmann, he began to sob uncontrollably. And then he fainted and he collapsed on the ground. 
What created that? Was it the horrid memories? Was it the anger? Was it the fear? It was something else. Yahil Denora would be interviewed by Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes months later. And listen to that, that interview. Denora explained that during the war he had feared Eichmann as somebody fundamentally different than himself. But in the courtroom, seeing Eichmann stripped of all his Nazi glory and all his Nazi power, Denor saw him for who he was, an ordinary man. Denor said to Mike Wallace, I was afraid for myself. That's why I collapsed to the floor. Because I saw me in him and he in me. And Mike Wallace wisely responded, Eichmann is in all of us. Dear ones, we don't just sin. Sin is in all of us. There's an old theological word that we need to resurrect and include in our prayer life, and it's the word iniquity. Do you know what iniquity means? Crookedness. To be bent. To be warped. Coming from Boston, I had to practice saying warped. Because in Boston, it's warped. <laughs> if you have a two-by-four that's bent or warped, is it of any good? Carpenters will tell you that you can take it and nail it to a straight board and keep it straight. But otherwise, you either have to cut it into pieces or throw it out. Because when it's warped, it's always going to go back to that inclination. Even if you try to straighten it with your hands. Our sinful nature is warped. It's filled with iniquity. That's why we must go back to the baptismal font where day after day we drown the old Adam, that iniquity, and we put on the new nature, the righteousness of Jesus, and he's been born in us again to give us a new inclination, a new desire. Yes, let's keep Herod in Christmas because he reminds us of the world that Jesus entered, but he reminds us also that Herod is us and he's in us as well. And that we live in a world that still makes his choices. The prophet Jeremiah tells us of the depravity of the heart when in Jeremiah 17 it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And we must confess that our heart too can be deceitful were it not for being born again. Yeah, let's keep Herod in Christmas. He reminds us of the world that Jesus entered, the dark world. He reminds us of the depravity, the darkness of the human heart. But this one too, the third and final truth. Herod reminds us that you can never remain neutral to the truth. It forces you to respond to it one way or the other. Herod reminds us that the truth not only has enemies, it creates enemies. Matthew 2, when Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all of Jerusalem with him. He was disturbed. He started to convulse. He was so shook. Why? Herod had been in power for 40 years. He was one of the most feared people throughout the entire world. He had killed, ready for this? He had killed his brother-in-law. He had killed his mother-in-law. He had killed his mother. He had killed his two sons out of his own insecurities. Caesar Augustus said of Herod the Great, it would be better to be a pig in his, his house than to be his son. So why does such a violent man shake at the, the birth of a baby? Give Herod credit. However, why ever, he took Jesus seriously. There was something deep within. And Herod wanted to snuff it out. I'm reading uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I've seen countless movies. I've just never read the book. It's fascinating. In Christmas Past, the image that the original artwork has for Christmas Past is of this individual coming in who looks more like a candle, a burning candle, than a person. And at one point near the end of the Christmas Past visit with, 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 with Scrooge, the visitor has been carrying a cap, which is actually an extinguisher for the candle itself. And Scrooge takes the cap, and he tries to put it over the flame. And 
and the visitor says, do you dare touch with human hands the truth that I speak to you from your past? And try as he might to, to, to extinguish that, that candle, that fire. Charles Dickens writes, but the fire just continued to, to shed its light all over the ground. Herod desperately wanted to snuff out that light. That's always our response with the depravity of our heart. We want to push it away. Or to quote Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. It's a great line, isn't it? But it's true of us in our sinful nature. We can't handle the truth. And yet Jesus stands in our midst and he says, if you hold to my teaching, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from the guilt of your past. Free from your fear of the darkness. Free from the anger that consumes you. Yes, let's keep Herod in Christmas because it reminds us of the danger of trying to reject the truth and snuff it out. I'll close with this story regarding Rose Kennedy, the mother of John F. Kennedy. Rose Kennedy was at a Bible study with Jess Moody, and when it was over, she went up and told him the story that I'm about to tell you. Jess Moody had challenged the students in the Bible study to make their hearts ready to meet Jesus because life is short for all of us, and we never know what the future can hold. That was his challenge. Rose Kennedy, Kennedy stayed after the class, and she went up to him and said, I've done what you were talking about here today, about making room. She went on to say that as a young bride, she became very enamored by the power of money, that Kennedy money, that we, money we hear about. She said, I became selfish. I lived only for myself and my own desires. The power of money had gripped me. She said, and then we gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, but very quickly it was discovered that she was severely mentally retarded, so much so that she would have to spend the rest of her entire life in an institution. She said to, to Jess Moody, Rose Kennedy said, my, my husband and I were so angry about this that it started to consume us in our life. And we could think of nothing but our anger toward God that he would allow this to happen. She said, one night my husband and I were to go to a social event and we were dressed and ready to go, she told Jess Moody. And at the last minute, both of us decided we can't go for fear that somebody at the event would ask us about our daughter and we would just scream in rage and we couldn't take that risk. It was on that night that she was filled with such anger that Rose Kennedy's maid finally came up to her and said, Mrs. Kennedy, I've been watching you for the last few weeks. I see how angry you are. If you don't do something, it's going to ruin you. Mrs. Kennedy, I think you should pray this prayer. Oh, Lord, make my heart a manger where the Christ child can be born. Rose Kennedy was so angry, she fired the maid on the spot. She went to bed that night and couldn't sleep. Imagine that. She couldn't sleep, and finally she got up. Didn't get any further than the side of her bed, and she went down on her knees. Oh, Lord, make my heart a manger where the Christ child can be born. That's my invitation to you this day. What consumes you? What's the darkness that creeps in? Oh, Lord, make my heart a manger that the Christ child might be born there. May that be your prayer. And as it is, as it is your prayer, may you be reminded that it's Christ who came into the darkness of your heart to bring the light of joy, of peace, of love, and of hope. And then may you know the truth, the truth that can't be snuffed out, the truth that can finally set you free from those things that have a hold on you. Let's keep Herod in Christmas. Amen.